me and giving me this honor, but thank you more importantly for what you're doing for patients and their families with neurologic disease. I'm very impressed with that. So I'm going to talk a bit about multiple sclerosis and give an overview of it because uh, as I've come to learn, uh, it's not as well recognized in India as uh, it is in North America, although that's changing rapidly. I would like to give an overview of what this is, give you a few uh, updates on, on, on progress we've made in understanding the condition, talk about therapy, disease management, and give you a glimpse into the future. But before I do that, I want to mention that at the conclave, we discussed brain inflammation more broadly than multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis and related conditions are one of the inflammatory diseases of the nervous system, but there are many others. And uh, these include the side effects of an infection. We call it para-infectious disorders. After a vaccine or an infection, the brain can become inflamed. There's encephalitis with a variety of organisms, uh, including the herpes virus, for example. Uh, there are paraneoplastic syndrome. Sometimes people will develop cancer, and the body turns against the nervous system and causes nervous system degeneration, not from a disease in the brain, but because of the cancer. We call it paraneoplastic. Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease have important inflammatory components, stroke, even autism, and many others. So the topic of this year's conclave, while focused on multiple sclerosis, is very broad and has major health impact worldwide. Now let me focus on multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is the prototype central nervous system inflammatory disease. It's a chronic disease of the central nervous system and it's characterized by multifocal inflammation. What that means is the brain and spinal cord tissue becomes irritated or inflamed. And multifocal means it's a patches here and there, comes and goes. And in the later stages, it's characterized by a degeneration of the brain tissue. And the degeneration of the brain tissue is accompanied by neurologic deterioration, particularly in walking. That's essentially what multiple sclerosis is. Let me go into a bit more detail. The prevalence of this condition in the United States is roughly 1 in 1,000 or 100 in 1,000. Based on the population, the estimate is 400,000 people are living with MS in the United States. I've learned since I came that we don't entirely know the prevalence in India. I've heard estimates ranging from 4 to 20 or 25 per 100,000. But assuming that the recognition of MS is lower because the awareness of it is less, the frequency or the number of cases may be just as high in India as in the United States, even though it's considered a low prevalence area. So the impact of this disease in India is quite high, and I think there'll be increasing recognition of that. This is more common in women. It typically begins in young people. 75% of the patients have moderate to severe disability and get progressively worse after 15 or 20 years of symptoms. And this can result in severe disability, reduced quality of life, and declining socioeconomic status. And importantly, this can have a very big impact on the family. It's not just a disease of the person with MS, it's a disease of the family. It can change it rather dramatically. Now one of the characteristics we've talked about for the last couple days is that the disease is variable in its uh, impact or manifestations. We call that heterogeneity. <clears throat> 20 to 30 percent of the patients will have very mild MS and may never become disabled. But it's difficult to identify that in the early stage of the condition. And 20 to 30 percent of the patients will have a very severe condition 
which can lead to chronic disability. So this leads to these kinds of questions. I hear this every day in my work. She wonders, what will happen to me? She wonders, will I need a wheelchair? These are all recently diagnosed patients that uh, I have seen. Will I be dependent on my husband? The patients very much want to remain independent and fear dependence. Can I continue in the job that I love doing? This is a teacher. So the issue is we don't have a very good way to predict exactly how the disease will unfold early after the diagnosis. Despite the variability, it seems as if it's the same condition. So, for example, I have seen twin pairs, both with MS, identical twins. And one of the sisters had very mild MS with some tingling and a little bit of trouble with fatigue, but was otherwise fine. And the other twin was in a wheelchair. How can we understand this? great degree of variability between two people whose parents were identical and whose genes are identical. And how can we predict what's going to happen early on? So far, this is an area we, where we need more research. Now, we make the diagnosis of MS based on typical clinical manifestations, typical MRI findings in the brain and spinal cord. Sometimes we do a lumbar puncture. And we, and most importantly, we have to be sure there's no other disease that could be causing the condition. So typical presentations are this. The optic nerve can become inflamed and the vision can diminish. The spinal cord can become inflamed and the conduction of electricity through the spinal cord can go down and so the legs tingle or don't work. The brain stem can become inflamed and so it may be difficult to see a single object or, or there may be numbness over the face or one of these kinds of symptoms uh, and other typical presentations. When we see these typical presentations along with very typical MRI changes shown here, the diagnosis of MS can be relatively straightforward. So on the top, if you look across, you're seeing three different levels of the brain. And in the middle one, you can see the dark spaces in the center. Those are called the brain ventricles. And around the brain ventricles, you can see the white spots. These are called periventricular lesions. They're around the ventricles. Very typical in appearance, very typical in location. And in the bottom, you can see that after this GD compound, this is a contrast agent. Some of those spots light up. If you look at the right hand one on the bottom, you can see that that one large lesion, it becomes white after the contrast. It's contrast enhancing. That means it's a very active lesion. And sometimes we see this in the spinal cord. If you see this, the, in the middle of the white, uh, the lines going down, you can see the spinal cord. And about halfway down, you can see a white lesion, an MS lesion in the spinal cord. That could typically cause numbness, tingling, walking problems, problems below that lesion because the electrical impulses can't get through there. It's inflamed or irritated. Now, there's no diagnostic test for MS. And there are other conditions that can mimic MS. And sometimes early in the disease, there's uncertainty about the diagnosis. So it requires a neurologist. And I heard a very interesting uh, talk from Dr. Singal from, uh, uh, from Mumbai this morning, who showed some data that the frequency of diagnosis goes up as you add more neurologists to the society and as you have more MRI scans. So I suspect that as neurology grows in India as a profession and there are more diagnostic capabilities that the frequency of finding this condition will go up. But you do need a neurologist in order to diagnose it. We don't have a, a blood test yet. These are common symptoms and you can see the list is very long. I won't go through it. 
Many of these symptoms are nonspecific. Many people without MS have fatigue. So if you have fatigue, the likelihood of having MS is low. That means it's not specific. But nearly all patients with MS have fatigue. So people sometimes wonder if they have fatigue in a family member with MS if they could have it. Now these are the forms. This is the most common thing. In the early stage, there are these relapses and remissions. They get inflammation. They have problems with their function. It gets better. That's called a remission. And then after a period of time, maybe 10 years or 20 years, it goes on to, it doesn't get better anymore, it only gets worse. And gradually over time, it becomes difficult to walk and other functions can be lost. On occasion, we don't see the relapses and the remissions. We see from the very beginning a gradually progressive neurologic problem, usually a walking problem. This starts a bit later. It doesn't, uh, doesn't have relapses. There's probably less inflammation in the nerve tissue. It's probably more degenerative. And right now, we don't have approved treatments for this form of the disease. Now, these are the potential complications of MS if it <coughs> is one, <coughs> excuse me, if it's one of the more severe forms and it's not treated. It can lead to neurologic disability. This can be weakness, sensory loss, visual loss, trouble walking or using the arms. Fatigue is a problem. Bowel, bladder, and sexual dysfunction are problems. Depression and anxiety are very common. Impaired memory and impaired cognition. These are complications that can occur in people with MS. And the consequences of these are listed here. There's an impact on employment. There's a very high level of divorce. There's social isolation. The person can change, the loss of the person. There can be dependence for self-care, and there's a very major impact on the children. I've seen this many times. I would say there's a lifelong impact on the children of parents who have these consequences. Now, I'm going to get back to uh, how this is beginning to change in a little bit. But let me tell you a few things about what we're learning about the condition. Some of this I find interesting. This, this is a table on the family risk of having MS. In the United States, if you have no relative with MS, your chances of getting MS are one in a thousand, 0.1 percent. But if your mother had MS, your lifetime risk is 50-fold increased. It's 5 percent. Now, that's a relatively low absolute risk. 5% is not very high, but it's 50-fold increased. And I've had very, many, many daughters of MS patients worried most of their lives about whether they had it. Now, if you have a sibling with MS, your lifetime risk is down a little bit. It's 35-fold increase, 3.5%. If you have an adopted sibling with MS, if you come into the family, even as a very young person, your risk is the same as, um, as the general population. If your twin has MS, you have a 50% chance. If you have an identical twin with MS, it's 50-50, 500-fold increase. But if you have a dizygotic twin, a non-identical twin, so you, you don't share the same genes, it goes back down to 50 kind of like a sibling. So what does this tell us? What this tells us is that there's a genetic basis for MS susceptibility, <clears throat> but that can't be the whole story. If that was the whole story, it would be 100 percent in people with the same genes. So there have to be factors that are interacting with these susceptibility genes to cause the disease. In terms of the genetic studies, we now know that there are between 50 and 100 areas of the genome that are variable in the population, and one variant increases the risk of MS a little bit. Generally speaking, these are, these are called risk loci. There are 50 to 100 of them. Individually, they're very, very, very minor risks, uh, increased risk. 
1.1 to 1.2 fold increase. When you put them all together, it still doesn't explain why people get MS very well. And we don't understand from the genetic studies why one twin has very severe MS, the other has mild MS, why one person would be fine and the other become disabled. So we're learning about the genetics, but so far it hasn't had a major impact on diagnosis, uh, treatment, or understanding how, why it's so variable. The environmental triggers are interesting. There's very good evidence that low vitamin D levels relate to the risk of MS. And some people think this may help explain why there's a variation geographically. So as you move toward the equator where there's more sunlight, sunlight causes ultraviolet light which generates vitamin D. As you move toward the equator, vitamin D levels go up, MS goes down. So there's a lot of thought that vitamin D is a risk factor. Prior EB virus infection is considered a risk factor. This is the virus that causes mononucleosis. And most studies have shown that it's very rare to get MS without having had a prior EB virus infection as measured by the blood test. And smoking is a risk factor. And this has been shown in multiple different studies. I listed some important unknowns because you may be wondering about some of these things. We don't know whether lifestyle makes any difference. We don't know whether diet makes any difference. And we don't know whether stress makes any difference. To the extent these have been studied, there's really not much evidence these have an impact. But I would say we wonder about these things. And our patients wonder about them. So we used to think that MS was intermittently active. And with relapses, it was active. And with remission, it was inactive. <clears throat> and if the relapses were occurring rarely, once a year or once every two years, and the recovery was good, we told our patients, don't worry about it. Everything looks fine. But a curious thing happened in many of the patients. When the patients got to age 50, they would begin to gradually deteriorate. And we had been telling them they were fine. So we thought there was a switch and something happened to change it from a relapsing remitting episodic condition in which the patient functioned well to a gradually progressive problem where they got disabled. That's the old view. Now we found out that was totally wrong. We found out that MS is active all throughout the disease, even though the patients don't have many symptoms at the early stage. We also found out that from the very beginning, MS can damage the axons, the, the nerve cells, the wires in the brain. It can irreversibly damage these wires, and this can accumulate over time, and that's what leads to this later stage of disability. So I'll show you a movie uh, just to demonstrate the point. This is the brain of a 42-year-old engineer in one of our studies who was imaged once a year or every six months for six and a half years. And the very first scan, I'm going to leave that on the right so you can see how it started. And then I'm going to play the movie on the left. And you'll see what happened in the brain over six and a half years. Now, he was relatively well working, coming in for regular clinic visits. But he wasn't ill. Uh, but this is what happened in his brain. You can see over time. These lesions come and go. And when you get to the last scan, where it'll stop, you can see those black cavities, which are the fluid-filled spaces within the brain. They've expanded. They're just about twice as big as they were. And that's because the brain has been damaged. And as the brain tissue is damaged and shrinks, those fluid-filled spaces get larger. So that's a big concern of ours now. There's ongoing brain damage in the early stage of MS. It's not just the disabling later progressive stage. And this is the reason for that. This is a picture taken from the brain of a very young person who unfortunately died from MS. 
And what you can see, so this is stained under the microscope with some uh, dyes that will stain the myelin covering and the axon, which is the nerve cell. And what you can see in that, you see three things going across from left to right. One, the top one is an axon that's intact, but the myelin covering, which is in red, has been stripped away between those arrowheads. And the next one, you can see the axon is intact, but the myelin has been stripped away in multiple places between those arrowheads. So the top two are axons that are intact, but they're demyelinated partially demyelinated. The bottom was the shocker. In the bottom one, there's demyelination, but there's all also a complete severing of that nerve cell. It goes along and then it's just cut, like a telephone wire that's snipped. And if you cut a wire, you know the electricity doesn't go down anymore. The light goes out or whatever the wire's doing. Now in the central nervous system, when you have the, we call this transection. In the central nervous system with a transection, that nerve cell will never recover. That's a terminal injury. Now this girl was 22. So in this picture, you, well, I'll skip through this a little bit, but in this picture on the right, this, this, this shows how many of these transected axons were present. And it turns out that in these areas, where the brain becomes inflamed, they're like mini strokes. They damage the axons irreversibly. Even though the patient recovers, there's been some residual damage. And this is what, um, so I'll show you another case. This was a patient of mine who was in another study, and I'll show you what this can lead to. This is a woman who was a bank teller, and she was, uh, generally fine at the beginning, but over eight years, this is what happened to her brain. You see how much tissue she lost? That's called brain atrophy, and we're finding that brain atrophy can occur early in MS because of this active process. So we've learned it's not a benign problem at the early stage. So the current view of the way this uh, works is that you have this course of MS. This white line going up is the loss of brain tissue, which starts at the beginning and it gradually continues up. And every once in a while, there's a relapse. Those are those little spikes. Now it gets to the red line. These numbers on the bottom, 30 is the age of onset. 50 is the age where this white line crosses the red line. And when that happens, the patient begins to experience disability. That's called a threshold. And when the pathology reaches the threshold, the patient can't function and decompensates and there's progressive disability. That's what we now know happens in MS. Now what I'm going to tell you in a little while is that I want to explain that there's great hope now and what I've shown you is not inevitable. By using disease-modifying drugs, which I'll mention in a bit, at the early stages of MS, we now know that we can inhibit brain shrinkage by 50%. We can block this pathology by 50%. Now I'm going to show you in the next slide what kind of an impact that will have. That will have a major impact in the later complications that affect the patients. And this is the slide to show it. If we cut that atrophy, that white line, if we cut that slope by 50%, you see now the patient crosses this threshold at age 75 instead of 50. 25 more years of function by getting the kinds of impact we can get with current drugs. This is the reason that we want to diagnose the condition early and treat it early because we can save brain tissue and prevent disability. Not completely, but, but I think very meaningfully. Now, therapies to improve quality of life. There are many medications, we heard about some of these today, that can be treated for the numbness and tingling, the pain, the fatigue, the bladder problems, the bowel problems, the depression. These are inexpensive medicines that can be used and can make a major difference. There's also a lot that can be done on the rehab side to treat weakness, spasticity, gait impairment, and some of these other problems that are listed. 
These are very important and uh, these are available uh, throughout India. And I'll show you a couple of quick examples of some of the difference that some of this can, uh, can make. This is a movie of a patient with MS at the Mellon Center uh, whose left foot drops. You see that? He, when he swings through, his foot drags. And he was falling, constantly falling, because he would catch his foot. Now, with a very, very simple, inexpensive device called an ankle foot orthosis, he walks much better. This is very inexpensive. And it meant, for him, it meant no more falls. This just, I guess, shows it coming from a different angle so you can see how his foot now lifts up. Here's another one. This is a very clever and really inexpensive device called a hip flexor assist device, HFAD. And this is a person with MS who really had a, a terrible degree of hip flexor weakness, and so she couldn't really, she, she could bear weight, but she really couldn't uh, bend her leg at the hip and knee or she would fall because of the hip flexor weakness. And so she, she has to swing her leg around. It's very difficult for her to walk, and she's exhausted by, by, that, by that effort. But with this hip flexor assist device, which is nothing more than a bungee cord, which is tethered at the waist and around the shoe. With the bungee cord, this is how she walks. Big difference. Able to go out for dinner made a big difference functionally. So there's a lot that can be done for patients anywhere in the world, really, without a great deal of expense. The other thing I want to mention is something else that can be done for patients all over the world, and that's treatment of other medical conditions. This is a study that was done by a colleague of mine in, um, in Canada who surveyed nearly 10,000 North American MS patients for cardiovascular comorbidities. These were high cholesterol, hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, and peripheral vascular disease. 53% of these patients had at least one of these. 16% had two, and 5.5% had, had three or more of these comorbidities. The comorbidity just means that in addition to MS, they also had these conditions. Now, what uh, Ruth Ann Murray found was that the MS got worse much faster for patients who had these comorbidities. Now, this is the length of time it takes to require assistance to walk. The blue line are, are the patients with no cardiovascular morbidities, and the orange are patients who have these cardiovascular morbidities. There was a median six-year difference for patients to progress to this level of MS who had these cardiovascular morbidities. What this means, I think, is that we might be able to make a significant impact on lessening the severity of MS if we treat these other conditions. So just a couple of uh, lessons that I've learned from comprehensive care. There are many ways to help patients with medications for symptom education, psychological support, and rehabilitation. And we may be able to lessen the severity of MS by treating modifiable cardiovascular risk factors, supplementing with vitamin D and smoking cessa cessation. These are very simple things, and these are probably very important. That's comprehensive care. Now, treating the disease, there is a race for a cure. The MS Society in the U.S. calls this an MS revolution. There's a race for a cure. So the question is, where are we in this race in 2012? And this, um, I kind of made this up. Uh, this is not an official category, but I wanted to tell you where I think we are. I think that there are six stages leading to a cure. None of the MS specialists who have joined me have ever heard of these six stages. This is, uh, I'm revealing this for the first time. So where are we? Uh, we're, we're about halfway through these six stages. Stage one is the development of drugs that would modify the course of MS. We call them the ABCR drugs. We're done with that stage. 
These are the ABCR drugs, uh, beta serum, Xtavia, Avonex, et cetera. These drugs are um, injectables. They all require injections at least once a week and some every day. They're too expensive. They're too expensive even in the U.S., let alone in an area where there's, where there's relatively a low income. Uh, they're modestly effective, but they have good safety, so we don't hurt anybody with these drugs. And some patients do rather well, um, surprisingly well. So there are some people that are well controlled with these drugs, but many patients break through. And the drugs are all about the same. In my opinion, it really doesn't matter too much which of these drugs you use. This is the reduction in the relapse activity with these different drugs uh, compared with placebo in the individual studies. They're all about the same. Stage two is the development of more effective drugs. 30% is not really adequate, if you ask me. And in practice, a lot of patients break through that. So stage two is the development of more effective drugs for this early MS stage, and we're, we're done with that now. We finished that stage. Tysabri is, uh, is one of uh, the more effective drugs. This blocks the entry of the blood cells going into the brain, and so it's like a light switch. You shut it off, and they can't get in there. There's no inflammation. It's a single IV infusion every four weeks, and this is highly effective. This shows the effectiveness of this treatment in the first year of the trial and the second year of the trial and in both years put together. And you can see that Tysabri, which is labeled natalizumab in this slide, dropped the disease activity, the clinical disease activity, by about 68 percent over the course of this. It's about double as effective as the ABCR drugs, which you can see here. As these dots go to the left, it becomes more effective. So ABCR are listed there. They're all kind of about the same, but then you switch way over to the left and you get this very high clinical effect size with this new drug. This one is uh, the first oral agent for MS. This is the first pill. Patients have been asking me for 20 years, when will we have a pill? Well, we have a pill now. It's called Fingolimod or Gelenia. I won't go through the biochemistry of this except to say that it's a single oral drug, a single oral dose, once a day. Most of the patients don't have many side effects, so they kind of like it. The problem with it is that this particular target of the therapy, the, the S1P, is on a lot of different cell types around the body, not just the brain, and not just the inflammatory cells. And so there are are, there are a lot of uh, problems with this potentially, such as cardiac problems, pulmonary problems, and so forth. But nevertheless, this is in this stage too. This is uh, much more effective than the ABCR drugs. This one says 54 percent reduced compared with placebo. So when you look at these on one graph, you can see the ABCR is 33, the natalizumab or tysabri is 68, and the fingolimod is 58. So we now have more effective drugs. Stage three, we're in progress. Uh, but we're making very good progress on stage three. Stage three is to use the drugs we have. We have about nine now, maybe 10, and we're going to have a couple more in the next year or two. So using these drugs for individual patient care is called personalized medicine. And we're, we're beginning to learn how to do this so that we can completely block MS disease activity in patients who are on these medications. This is the optimal use of these drugs for personalized treatment plans. We're in progress. I would say that we're probably going to be through this stage in the next few years. So just to show you how effective this can be, we can use the MRI to monitor the ABCR therapy. This was a study that was five years, and it looked at the MRI spots that I showed you as a marker for effectiveness of the therapy. And this shows that in patients on this drug, this was beta feron in this case, if they had no new lesions, in the first year of therapy, they stayed, they stayed under excellent control for the entire five years. 
But the more lesions they got on their follow-up brain scan, the worse they did. So we can now use that as a tool to monitor therapy and adjust therapy to achieve what we're calling disease-free activity. That's our goal now in MS, unthinkable 10 years ago. Disease-free activity means no relapses and no MRI activity. And the patient can go about their business and feel almost like they don't have MS. We start the disease-modifying treatment, we monitor with clinical visits and MRI, and we adjust therapy if the patient's not at the goal. And right now, we can achieve this goal in about 50% of the patients. Trial designs are not nearly as well developed as for the inflammatory part of MS. Brain atrophy, by the way, especially atrophy of the gray matter part of the brain, is very promising as a clinical trial measure for this stage of MS therapies. And many studies are now started. And I predict that we will have therapies that are effective in slowing this portion of the brain, I think, within about five years. Stage five, recovery. We don't just want to slow the deterioration, we want to improve the function. We'd love to have the patients get out of the wheelchair. This is restoration or recovery. Believe it or not, we're actually starting trials for this form of therapy with stem cells and with molecules that look like they will promote remyelination. So we're very hopeful that within five years or so, there may be a hint that these strategies are going to help us with stage five. Now stage six is a little bit space age. This is preventing the disease altogether. And once we understand what's driving it, I think we're going to be able to develop strategies for prevention. And when we get to that, I think we will be where the patients want to be. So my conclusions for you are that MS and related conditions are very important as a cause of neurologic disability and human suffering. And I think through the <clears throat> uh, Srinivasan Neurologic Institute and the Center for uh, Clinical Neurosciences, I think you're dealing with this problem. I think it's a very important problem. Recognition of the conditions is important, and it's increasing in many parts of the world, including India. And I predict that you'll find more and more of this as the neurologic expertise and access to neurologists and the diagnostic equipment and awareness increases. And there's been dramatic progress in this field. When I started my career, we had nothing. I went to the MS clinic with my mentor, and we did what we could with an antidepressant, and then we went back to our labs and we went to work. We had no treatments, and we didn't know what was going on. It's been dramatic progress in my uh, career. So my final takeaway is that if I were you, I would have an expectation for continuing progress, because I do believe that the progress is accelerating, not level. And I think a hope for a cure is actually quite realistic, at least in my lifetime at some point. So this is what we want. We want the patients to say, my future will no longer be unsure. My grandchildren will never hear the words, you have MS. And I thank you very, very much for the honor of having me as your orator. We have the customary question and answer session. I would request the audience to participate.
as much as possible. So, shall we start with the first question? There are microphones available there. Yes, Amakshi. Professor of Neurology at Professor of Neurology. So, thank you very much for such an interesting talk. Uh, uh, when we were students at some time ago, there was some talk about viral persistence. Persistence in the nervous system of a virus acquired very early in childhood. Does the theory still hold good? Does it get reactivated? <coughs> the second question is, do these viral proteins, antibody, antigens, share antibodies with the myelin, something like a cross reactivity. Do these theories still hold good? Thank you very much for your lecture. Well, thank you for your questions. The, when I was a medical student, we were beginning to see the oligoclonal bands in the spinal fluid. These are immunoglobulins and they're clonally restricted, meaning they're, they're, they, there must be an antigen to the oligoclonal bands. And I was taught that in all likelihood this was measles virus. And so when I was in medical school, I was taught that MS was caused by an abnormal measles virus. But that didn't turn out to be the case. And then I was taught about other viruses. And the bottom line is that there's been a search for viruses in the brain of patients with MS for the last 30 years. And there have been a number of promising leads and they've gone nowhere. And as best we know, there is no infectious agent that's within the nerve tissue and is stimulating the occurrence of MS. Now that's not to say that there couldn't be one. Well, some of us believe that there should be continued research, but it's all been negative. Your second question is still active, and that is if there's an immune response against a virus in the body, could that cross-react with the brain tissue and damage the brain tissue as an innocent bystander. Yes, I believe that happens. That's called molecular mimicry. And there are a lot of people that believe that MS and some of the related conditions have some component of molecular mimicry. As a matter of fact, it's a common observation that MS patients will have a relapse following a viral infection. So I think that is still intact. Excuse, Excuse me. Yes. And thus. Professor, in the stage three, you said that there are nine drugs. Uh, could you tell us which are these nine drugs which are in stage three? That is question number one. Question number two is vitamin D3, the lack of it has a good correlation, you said. So while treating MS, would supplementary therapy with vitamin D3, be, vitamin D be effective? Thank you. I'll, I'll do that last question first. Um, there are clinical trials now of vitamin D supplementation to determine whether or not a vitamin D would be effective in slowing the activity of MS or the progression of MS. But vitamin D is rather innocuous and not particularly expensive. So in our clinic, uh, we treat patients with 2,000 units per day of vitamin D, which is very inexpensive and we monitor the vitamin D level. And we push the vitamin D level into the upper range and adjust the vitamin D to get it there. Um, yes, that's a very reasonable thing to do given the information which we have about vitamin D. I didn't have time to go through most of it. The other question is what are the various drugs? We have what are called first-line drugs, which are the ABCR drugs. I, I listed those. So we generally will use one of those first. It would be very nice if we could do a blood test and determine which of those the patient would respond best to, but we don't have that yet. So we'll pick one of those drugs, monitor the patient, and if the patient breaks through by the MRI scan or with relapse, then we'll go to what we call the second-line drugs. And right now we have two second-line drugs that are much more highly effective. 
but I think uh, we will probably have uh, an additional two that are very highly effective. Now there's another pill coming along which should be out uh, at least in the U.S. it'll probably be out within the next year which looks more highly effective than the injectables but it's a pill and it looks like it's relatively safe. So I think the use of the ABCR injectables, injectables will get supplanted by, by this pill. Now one of the second line drugs, I'll finish this long answer quickly. One of these second line drugs is very highly effective but it has a rare complication of a fatal brain infection. And we're learning how to predict that fatal brain infection so that we can use that drug more in a, and more safely. So what I mean by stage three is learning how to use the different options to get the maximum number of people disease activity free. And we're just learning how to do that. Miriam? Yes, Thank you. Miriam. Um, Tarsabri, you've been hearing about Tarsabri for a few years now. I just want to know, is it most effective at the early onset stage or can it be used in more progressed disease? <clears throat> yeah, uh, so the question was whether... Can say it a bit louder? I could repeat that. Yeah. I think the question was whether Tysabri or natalizumab, which is one of the second line drugs, can be used early or is no. it all... Can it, can it be used later or does it have to be used only at the early onset of the disease? Okay, so we're, so uh, the question is, can we use Tysabri later on in the disease as well as early? Yes, we do use it in more advanced stages of MS, but we generally use it when we feel there is inflammation because the drug works to inhibit inflammation. And if we think the patient is very gradually, slowly worsening at age 65, we, we wouldn't use it. But with Tysabri, it's a very interesting situation we're in now because we now have a blood test that will tell us whether someone is at risk for this brain complication. And about half the patients are and half are not. So what we're doing is for patients who are not at risk, we're using that drug much earlier. We're actually using it as a first line drug. And the effectiveness is extremely high when we do that. Thank you for your very clear lecture. I'm not a neurologist, but I have this basic uh, question and doubt. Uh, do you find the incidence of MS higher in uh, our children who have been diagnosed to have autism? No, I'm not Are aware. Are they related in any way? Yeah, I'm not aware of a connect. I'm not aware of, uh, uh, do any of the other neurologists here know of any connect with uh, autism? The question was whether there's a relationship between autism and multiple sclerosis, and I think the answer is no. Not as far as I know, no. no. How often you have associated uh, strabismus with uh, MS? As an ophthalmologist, we've just seen a couple of cases. Well, congenital, I don't think there's much connection between congenital strabismus and multiple sclerosis. Um, we, we certainly see abnormalities in ex, the extraocular movements, uh, most commonly in internuclear ophthalmoparesis or ophthalmoplegia uh, or a skew deviation, but these are acquired uh, as opposed to congenital. Thank you. Okay, uh, can I ask you a question? Uh, what would you recommend for a secondary progressive patient on a wheelchair as a treatment to make his life more comfortable? you know, with the various symptoms that they're dealing with. Well, yeah, I, I think that the, in the patients who are progressive in a wheelchair, uh, that's an excellent uh, circumstance for comprehensive care with rehabilitation, medications for stiffness and bladder dysfunction, uh, dev devices, Weakness. adaptive devices, uh, vitamin D, smoking sensation and wellness, preventive medical care. All of those things make a big difference. But they don't get the patient out of the wheelchair, which is what uh, we would like to do. Yeah, so if you take one thing at a time, let's say the bladder control, would you have uh, any drugs to make more comfortable for him? Yes, there's a whole range of approaches to bladder management. 
It depends. It's a complicated issue. So the symptomatic treatment and rehabilitation is a big topic. But there are different causes of bladder problems, uh, and they're treated separately. So it has to be evaluated and then treated specifically so that you get the right treatment. Okay. Dr. Zahir? Dr. Rudik, I have a question of some importance in the sense that um, a lot of literature has been published and a lot of um, cardiothoracic surgeons have been implanting a stent in the jugular vein hoping that this disease is one of venous insufficiency. I don't think it is one but I think it deserves your comment to the general public at large. Yeah, I, I really appreciate your bringing that up. I didn't bring it up myself, um, but I, I think it is important to discuss. <clears throat> uh, it, there was a vascular surgeon in Italy whose wife has MS, and the vascular surgeon developed a theory that MS might be caused by blockage of the veins that drain the brain and that because these veins are blocked, the blood backs up and there is damage to the brain tissue leading to inflammation. It was a revolutionary hypothesis that MS is caused by venous insufficiency or blockage of the venous uh, drainage of the brain. And uh, this was picked up by the media worldwide, especially in Canada, where there were very moving and compelling documentaries about Dr. Zamboni and his wife and this uh, revolutionary treatment. Now Zamboni additionally made the claim that this occurred in everybody with MS, 100%, and in nobody without MS, according to his studies, which seemed a little bit too good to be true. Um, we don't generally see that in medicine. Nothing is ever 100% or zero. And he also made the claim that by putting a catheter, a balloon uh, catheter into the venous system and dilating the jugular vein, that the patients were cured. So this it came to be known the CCSVI hypothesis. Um, this was about two years ago. Uh, I was one of the strong advocates for research in this condition, and I still am, because I think we need new ways of thinking and breakthroughs in MS, and this seemed very hopeful, and we were extremely excited about this. Now, uh, I should say that the Canadian and the, and the U.S. National MS Societies uh, funded seven studies to look into this uh, for a total of $2.7 million, and those studies are ongoing. Now, as time has gone on, we've seen quite a number of reports that refute the Zamboni findings. Uh, unfortunately, um, there are increasing numbers of reports that simply don't find this. So from the point of view of where, where I feel right now, I think it's highly unlikely this is going to hold up, and this may eventually join the list of therapeutic claims in MS that we've seen uh, over many years. Now, there is another aspect of this, and that is that treatment centers have developed all around the world to do venous angioplasty or even venous stents. And generally speaking, we don't recommend these treatments for our patients because it doesn't seem to cure the disease. We've seen many people have this, and it doesn't cure the disease. There have also been several deaths. So this is a current controversy in MS. I would say it's probably not going to turn out to be a treatment advance for people with MS. I don't recommend it. Sir, I am a pediatric neurologist. Recently I had seen a case. He's a 16-year-old boy who presented with just numbness, starting at the big toes, spreading on to the upper extremity, up to the chest he had the numbness, loss of touch sensation alone. And he was seen by the neurosurgeons, he landed in the neurosurgical block 
and he was seen there by the neurosurgeon and uh, when they found demyelination they thought it was post infectious uh, demyelination was treated with steroids and he was discharged now after 6 months he has come to the neurology block and when i see him the same sensation in between apparently he had had a relapse and the touch sensation is impaired in the big toe the same ev evolution of symptoms and now it is at the tip of the nose and both feet no other symptoms no other sensory change motor function is very good he is uh, physically fit he plays cricket good in studies and apparently happy about himself but the touch sensation he is aware of it so there has been a time lag of 6 months and the investigations mri shows distinct demyelination in the spine as well as the brain stem the brain stem demyelination is an additional uh, sign clinical sign that is added initially it was just suspected as cv cv junction abnormality but then they ruled they came to know it was demyelination and passed on the case to the neurology side so now i ha i have no distinctive label to say what it is and the parents are anxious as to why it is repeating after a lapse of uh, 6 months it is only the touch sensation that is bothering him so what do i tell the patient so is the, won't is the brain stem lesion is new it wasn't new. there at the Added beginning on. okay well uh, according to the new diagnostic criteria he would he would qualify as having ms now having the diagnosis of MS doesn't necessarily answer all the questions. It doesn't answer how severe is his case, what is his prognosis, should he be on disease modifying drugs. I would monitor such a case for a short period of time, maybe up to a year. And if he develops new lesions on the MRI, uh, he's a good candidate for disease modifying therapy. One last question, Professor Sunil Narayan. Thank you. Uh, Professor Rudak, we really enjoyed your uh, well-organized and uh, uh, thoughtful talk. Uh, from your talk, uh, I could see that you are not only a scientist, but also a visionary. So let me ask this uh, issue. I'm always uh, worried when the question starts like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I uh, work in a national institute where we have uh, patients uh, predominantly uh, from the um, uh, rural and semi-rural uh, and semi-urban areas uh, coming over because uh, this institution provides totally free treatment for almost all the conditions. So uh, this is in Pondicherry, away from, uh, the three hours drive from here. Now, uh, over the last uh, 10 years where I've been working there, uh, I've been seeing that uh, there is a, uh, definitely more and more cases are being diagnosed with the, just because of the uh, uh, starting of the facilities of MRI scanner and evoc potentials and other um, uh, CSF uh, uh, oligoclonal blinds, all these things when you start doing, you started picking more and more cases. Now, uh, previously MS was a disease which were in the developed world, were relatively affluent part of the world, so uh, the, even though the treatment was quite uh, uh, available, uh, disease modifying treatment was uh, costly, some of either the national system or uh, healthcare systems or maybe the patients uh, themselves were somewhere or other afford, were able to afford. Now though the incidence and prevalence of the disease is still not as high as many other co more common neurological problems, to the affected patients it's a really uh, devastating problem. Uh, so what I've found that over the last five, six years, nearly 40 to 45 cases we would have diagnosed of definite MS cases. What happens is that when we diagnose and then tell them that uh, the disease modifying therapy is available but it's a bit costly and uh, unfortunately <coughs> the government is not providing this drug free of cost. Uh, they start uh, philosophizing their entire disease. Uh, it typically goes back to the Indian philosophies of taking everything for sort of uh, fate and they just resign to the fact that uh, there is problem and uh, whatever treatment is available, it's beyond their reach 
So they resort to other treatment and they don't come back even. Even though we have the address, we write to them. Madam Ann Gonsalves keeps uh, asking me to send them over. If we write the letters, they don't even come back because they know that they have a disease. Of course, you have treatment, but we just can't afford and you can't provide this to us. So my question is, now the disease has become, uh, we know that it occurs in tropical countries. It is there in the developing parts of the world. I think there is a need for a very concerted effort for a global campaign to bring down the cost of this uh, ABCDR drugs and other drugs. <clears throat> it's not easy as an HIV treatment, which is now provided free in India, uh, because the, uh, the, the, uh, the disease, the impact in numbers is perceived to be very low. It's very unlikely that any national strategies will come to provide free treatment, etc. So the only way I see is that somehow we must try to bring down the cost of these drugs. Thank you. Well, one of the points I tried to emphasize is that there are many things that the neurologist and team can do for patients with MS uh, above and beyond the disease-modifying drugs. I think the need for education, uh, psychological support, family support, uh, symptom management, rehabilitation, and monitoring is uh, very important to the patient uh, with or without the disease modifying drugs. Um, now, having said that, I completely agree with you that it's unacceptable that these drugs be inaccessible to people who need them. Um, uh, and I'm hoping, and I have been hoping, that the cost of these drugs will come down with increased competition. We haven't seen it, but I believe this will still will happen uh, over time. There's a movement to develop generics, especially for clotirum or copaxone. There is an effort, I think that'll move forward to develop a generic copaxone. And I think this will also happen with the, with the interferons. So with time, I think this will happen. But I, th I agree with you 100%. It seems somewhat inhumane to make a diagnosis of MS, say there's a treatment, but you can't have it. And so that's, uh, I think you're, you're raising a very, very crucial point. Um, I personally don't have the power to bring the price down, but I'll see what I can do. It's my great pleasure for all of you to give a standing ovation to the Srinivasan family. But for their generosity and support, the neurology would not have progressed to what it has today. The final thing I'd like to tell Professor Rudik is that Louis Rowland, who was T.S. Srinivasan orator and one of America's most, has sent me two quotations, which you might like to write. First quotation is, please listen to the patient. He's trying to tell you the diagnosis. The second quotation is, hurry, hurry, use that new drug before it stops curing you. Thank you very much. Okay. I think we have one. Last question before we leave the hall. I'm an anesthesiologist, and uh, I'm aware I'm an anesthesiologist, and uh, the contraindication, the only contraindication for spinal and epidural analgesia, I understand is multiple sclerosis. Is there any method by which I can sort of identify a dormant MS in a patient? Because every day we'll be administering very frequently spinal and epidural analgesia. So I've heard this and I don't believe it. Uh, all of the MS patients who become pregnant and want to have epidural anesthesia have it. Uh, I have never seen a problem with it yet. Uh, even if you put the anesthetic into the CSF, I don't think it would hurt a person with MS. Uh, and I've reviewed the literature on this and I can't 
I hear this, but I can't find evidence for it, and my own experience is it's perfectly fine to do epidural anesthesia in an MS woman. No, this is when you already know that she's having MS, but uh, when I'm not aware that a person is having MS, and then following the procedure, she develops um, a neurological deficit. Okay, well, let me, uh, let me say that I don't think it has anything to do with the epidural anesthetic. It is not rare for MS to first manifest postpartum. And so it would be understandable for a woman to have a baby, develop MS, and relate it to the epidural. It has nothing to do with the epidural. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for your attendance. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your support. Please join us for tea. Thank you. Thank you.